Leap of Faith podcast fans. Welcome to this week's episode with yours truly, Randy Silver. This week, my guest is David Dodd. He is the perfect guest for the Leap of Faith because he's here to talk about personal and community resilience. Before we get into David, I want to do what I always do every week. Law fans around the world, thank you so much for listening in. We appreciate you so much giving me the feedback on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, connecting with me over email, however you're doing it. Thank you so much. I love creating these for you. I love creating the YouTube videos for you. Please go like, subscribe, review, however you're listening or watching. And it will really help me continue to grow the brand of the leap of fate and for me to get the message out to more and more people. This is why I want to bring David on this week because his message will resonate no matter how old you are, how young you are. David is the head of the globally recognized International Sustainable Resilience Center, ISRC, and he's also dealt with two near-death experiences in his life. As a result of both, David has a very unique resilience on both the macro and micro level. And let me tell you about it. David has helped and led recovery efforts for multiple national disasters, including in the United States, Hurricane Katrina, in Japan, Fukushima tsunami. Through his recovery help, he was able to found the ISRC and is dedicated to furthering United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and is one of the eight public-private partnerships special centers of excellence affiliated with the UN Economic Commission for Europe International PPP Center of Excellence. A lot to say there, but I think what you could get out of that is he's doing some great stuff globally if you're affiliated with the UN and you're able to do all that sustainable. His ISRC strives to improve disaster resilience and sustainability worldwide by specializing in improving people first and looking out for the people, their sustainability, and help them with disaster resilience. While helping out Puerto Rico in 2019 with their uh, disaster recovery, David unfortunately contracted the deadly bacteria that led to the amputation of his left leg. Having already dealt with the near-death experience, uh, he was in a car crash early in his life, David now really c- tries his best to live his life day by day helping people through tragedy like he is by helping people understand community resilience, personal resilience, and inspiring them to move forward with their life as he's been able to do. As we're all coming out of the pandemic, depending where you're at, it's still pretty bad. This is some of the goals that we want to talk about as well. So David reached out to me about coming on the podcast to share the ISRC, his overall story of overcoming adversity. And David, you are the leap of fate. You are the perfect guest for this type of story. So I appreciate you coming on today. And without further ado, David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Randy. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've seen some of your previous work and it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, felt like I said a lot there. So let's give you a moment to kind of sum that all up for everyone. Can you kind of high level to everybody what you do and give us an overview of what that was? Well, you did such a great job, of <laughs> me, and and that's a mouthful. I know when you when you lay all that out, uh, but basically, uh, our purpose uh, at the center is to help people and communities and countries uh, become more resilient, and we mm-hmm. do that through a mechanism public of public private partnerships, but not just. And if you guys have heard of public private partnerships, you know they they have a mixed reputation. Some uh, you know, are accused of being backroom deals where, you know, companies get to build things and the taxpayers pay for them and all of this. Uh, the ones we do are not like that. Mm. They follow principles, as you said, of people first. So that is based on transparency, equity, inclusion, stakeholder involvement, uh, and they all have sustainability and resilience built into them. So, We are all about that, and we're also about integrating resilience into projects of all kind, Uh, those that are intended to to increase resilience, but also uh, projects of any type that involve, you know, large uh, 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 infrastructure or buildings or anything like that. We want to be there to make sure that they have sustainability uh, and that they're resilient. And what's the difference and why do you say sustainable resilience? I think Hmm. that's probably a pretty good follow-up. And the real thing is 
you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. If a project's not sustainable, no matter what it is, uh, it, it can't be resilient. And if it's not resilient, how can it be sustainable? You know, if you build a flood protection system and it's not, it's not sustainable and it gets wiped out, then you have to rebuild it. Well, when you yep. rebuild it, it can be more resilient, but you've had to rebuild something. So guess what you've done? You, you use twice the amount of resources. Yep. So that's, that's really the, our core purpose. Now, parallel to that, I continue to do disaster recovery uh, uh, on a case by case basis uh, because you know, again, recovery uh, uh, leads to resilience if it's done the right way. Yep. Years and years, Randy, you know, the, the governments just rebuilt what was there. And finally, they figured out, hey, you know, if you if you keep put, putting something in the in, in, in its place, whatever that was, whether it's a house or, you know, or a road or whatever, and it keeps getting washed away, well, you kind of need to do something about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's like definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Nothing is going to change. Exactly. And so they finally realized that. So now governments are, are really embedding resilience into everything uh, uh, in, in recovery, which is a great thing. Yeah. So, you know, and in, in that, that is really the kind of the parallel with, with, with my life. Not that I've done the same thing over and over, although some people probably <laughs> well would say, yeah, he's a little crazy, but uh it's it's learning to adapt and really randy at the core of resilience is adaptation yes and and with global and, warming that's more important than ever because how are we adapt into our changing world i'm so glad you brought that up uh because uh, uh john Kerry, the president's climate yep. czar, was interviewed in on cnn uh, about a week ago uh he was in a town hall meeting and the, the, the moderator kept saying, well, yeah, we have to be carbon zero. We have to get to net carbon zero. And he said, oh, absolutely. But in the meantime, the climate's already changing. This is not something we can just stop tomorrow. Yep. If, you know, if we stopped emitting carbon completely tomorrow, the, the, the implications of what's already happened with climate change will go on for decades and decades to come. Yep. So we, we have to adapt. And the unofficial slogan of, of my center is adapt or perish. Mm, and very true though. Now, this moment, Randy, there are people suffering somewhere in the world because they, they, they're not just their governments, but their governments and themselves did not learn these principles of adaptation. And that's really why I'm, 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 you know, talking to you today uh, is to show people how they can become more resilient and how through that their communities can become more resilient yeah and that's actually really near to my heart because i went to uc santa cruz i got a dual major in environmental studies and economics with emphasis in green energy so which is obviously very important to how do you build a sustainable economy sustainable way for people in, in the future so I think this is a really good conversation. I want to table this for a second to go back to the disaster recovery, if that's okay with you, because I have a question for you that we spoke about off podcast. I really want the audience to hear. You know, I'm 27, so I've been through some disasters. You know, I've never lived through one personally besides uh, when I was like six months old, the earthquake in Southern California happened, the Northwood one. I was actually at the epicenter of it, and I slept through the whole earthquake, my parents said. Funny enough, but wow. luckily I haven't been through anything since then. You've been to Fukushima, you've been to Hurricane Katrina, Puerto Rico, I'm sure much more. The giving my audience, because a lot of us probably haven't seen it. Yes, we've seen videos, we've seen pictures, but never does it justice. When you get on the ground and you're seeing the after effects of a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, what is going through your head? How do you help these people? What do you tell them? And what do you even start once you get on that ground? Yeah, it's tough. I'm not going to lie to you. It, it you know, when, when I saw the aftermath of Katrina mm. and I, I'm in New Orleans, but I'm actually grew up in North Louisiana, was still living there when that happened. And I drove down and I saw the Superdome. I, I, I literally wept. Mm. Um, but you have to realize why you're here and you're not here to, you're not here to, to cry. 
you cry for them inside, but you're here to help them. Mm -hmm. The same thing with Fukushima. And as horrible as the devastation of New Orleans was, and, and in, in New Orleans is still recovering, Randy. That's a really important side point. That's almost 20 years. Yeah. Almost 20 years. It, it, it will be 16 years uh, in a couple of months. Mm. And so when you think about that from that time frame, um, you can imagine uh, the, how, the, how bad the devastation was. And in Japan, um, I, I, I have photos uh, that I told you I'd share with you. Because you really have to see it to, to understand it. We topped a hill. We were going up and down the east coast of Japan. We visited five cities that had been completely uh, devastated. And we came over the top of a hill, and there was this huge area that was just completely wiped clean. Mm. And there was what looked to me like a mountain behind that. Now, the mountains in Japan are like the mountains of California. They're parallel to the coast. This one was perpendicular and uh, or horizontal. And I looked at my host and I said, that's a mountain? He said, no, that's what was there where the big empty spot was. That's unreal. Um, unreal. That was a city, that was a city of 30,000 people that was wiped off the face of the earth. So so where do you start when you go to these places and you're there to do recovery? Is it more emotional support, physical support? Hey, let's make sure we get water, basic food for them. So where do you start the recovery? That's a really important, really, really important point, Randy, that a lot of people uh, don't see because all they see is the immediate aftermath. And yeah. that is actually response. There are three elements to, to disasters. There is response there is recovery, and then there is what they call hazard mitigation, which means you're trying to prevent that from happening again. Yep. All of those things together are embedded in, in the term we say resilience. So the response is get them to a safe place, get them food and water, get them shelter. Those are all mm. critical components of response. Normally, I come in after that. And I certainly admire and am thankful for, as we all should be, the first responders yeah. of people that are there on the front lines. They're Thank putting, you so much, absolutely. everyone who does that. They, they like 9-11, they ran into the building instead of running away from the building. Mm -hmm. um, but then when once everything is stabilized, then what do you do? You know, well, you have to start by finding out what are the priorities what needs to be done first in this recovery? Do our people needing housing that are in temporary shelter? They can't stay there forever. Do they need housing? Do, do businesses need to be able to get back up and running so they can employ people and keep the economy going? Are there things that need to be planned now so that when that recovery occurs, when it's implemented, it also includes being more, becoming more resilient, that yep. resilience is embedded into recovery. And from that comes hazard mitigation, which is basically what many people think of when they think of resilience is that part. And that is certainly you know, critical component. And so it's making things more uh, uh, to be able to better withstand adverse events, no matter what those events are. So can we and, can ask you a question really quick? Sure. The, the, the thing that happened with New Orleans, the, the reason why it was so bad was the levee broke and that just obviously created the flooding. How do you go back and create a better resilient, a better infrastructure so that doesn't happen the second time? Is it structure engineering? Is it architecture? Everyone come together and saying we need to build this better so we don't have the same thing happen 50, 100 years from now. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. They came back after that, after that levee and that's what destroyed New Orleans. It was not the hurricane. The hurricane did some damage, but the hurricane center was in, in uh, east uh, of New Orleans in Mississippi, where it wiped everything completely clean. Uh, but in New Orleans, all, the damage was from flooding because of that levee. It's a great point that you bring up, Randy. Mm -hmm. because they made a decision, and I say they, New Orleans and the federal government working together, uh, and the state of Louisiana made a decision. We can't let this happen again. So they built a $17 billion flood protection system. 
Now, you know, when we hear trillions being being, uh, you know, spent to try to recover from COVID, 17 billion doesn't have the impact that I don't think it used to, but that's a yeah. lot of money. And they built a protection system all the way around Louisiana. Which wasn't there beforehand. It was not there before. Got it. Yeah. And and it, it's it, at places, it's 15 feet tall. And it has gates, watertight gates that can open to let people out uh, or in. And then the gates shut and it's completely waterproof. It's an amazing piece of engineering. And it was necessary uh, because, you know, there were there were people that said, well, they ought to just, you know, leave New Orleans and go settle somewhere else. Yeah. OK, but the problem with that is, you know, maybe people could do that. But, you know, we're, we'll lose a big chunk of, of the culture of, of the United States if that happens. New Orleans, New York, and San Francisco are the cultural international heart of the of the United States, in my opinion. Yeah, they, and where and where are these people going to go? Their whole life washed away. It's not like you know, like in the 1930s. I know none of us were alive at that point. But the Dust Bowl, where are you going to go? You don't have anything. Where are you right? So like, you can't just leave them. They need to figure out how to re get their life back together. Yes, and we could all go to California like they did, but I don't think California is ready for New Orleans. <laughs> the Mardi Gras, maybe. I think we could handle that. Other than that. <laughs> so, so, but the problem with that is, even with that, even taking the, the human element out, the Mississippi River is the artery of our both, you know, it, exporting food to the rest of the world. I mean, the the breadbasket of, of the world is, is the Midwest and the, the crops from the Midwest come down the Mississippi. So you're just going to tell people in other countries that, you know, that are having problems feeding, mm. okay, we're not going to rebuild New Orleans. So they can't come down the Mississippi anymore. And so, you know, there, there are so many things, and this is really bringing up a good point, Randy. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that need to be considered when you look at what needs to be done to help make, places more resilient yeah well then let me ask you this question fukushima you know that ended up being a nuclear disaster how do you clean that up like we know nu nuclear radiation sits in the ground and the water and the environment for generations if not multiple generations easily like we're talking like you know like 100 200 years how do you come back and resettle there or do you can't well that's a good point uh, what 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 the reality is that Fukushima was nothing like Chernobyl. I mean, Chernobyl, no one's going to be able to live there for a thousand years. Yeah. And, th and that TV show, bad. by the way, if you guys haven't seen Chernobyl, I think it was HBO or Showtime, HBO. It yeah. was so good. It gives you a really interesting look at what happened. Please go watch it. But sorry, David, continue. No, no, no. And 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 guys that are younger may not even know what Chernobyl is. Yeah. Because... Actually, do you want to say what that is really quick for everybody? Yeah, yeah. A, 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 a massive a uh, nuclear reactor uh, that actually at the time was in Ukraine, but Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union. So they say in the Soviet Union uh, exploded and uh, uh, poured radiation. And when I say poured, you know, you can't see radiation. Yeah. <laughs> you have a Geiger counter, right? But it caused radi radio uh, radioactive poisoning of that an entire area, the community and I don't know how big it was. I don't remember, Randy, but it, it was several, you know, tens of thousands of people had to be completely evacuated. A lot of people died. A lot of people got sick later. And to this day, that was what, 25 years ago? To this day, no one can be there. No one can live there. Nothing can live yep. there. So, but Fukushima was not that bad. They were able to contain it. Now, did, there was some uh, radiation leakage, but nothing worse uh, when I say worse, I mean, I mean, it's all bad, but it wasn't any worse than something like Three Mile Island, which happened here in the U.S., you know, back in the, I think that happened in the 70s. Uh, and it was bad and people suffered, but, but it was not devastating to the point that people couldn't, couldn't relocate or come back. Got so they seal, they, they have that under control. They're repairing it. They're going to, they're going to move it off of the coast. So that it's not sitting there right on the coast. And why are nuclear reactors on the coast? Because they use tremendous amounts yeah, of water. water. Yeah. Right. But you know, that water can be piped as well. Yeah. 
so anyway, uh, the real devastation was caused by the tsunami. A lot of people say the earthquake and tsunami, but Japan has done amazing things in becoming more resilient to earthquakes. Uh, they've learned how to design buildings. Uh, and I know California has done, 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 done similar yeah. things. Yeah, I lived in San Francisco for five, six years, and I would be in these big skyscrapers. It's like, dude, if an earthquake happens, you know, when you walk in, it says like green or it's going to be gold lead building, green lead building, earthquake proof. But like, it, you definitely have that thought in the back of your head. Like, I hope nothing bad happens for sure. Yeah, I, I lived in San Diego for four years yeah. and went through uh, my first earthquake, and I was on the 10th story of a building. <laughs> in downtown San Diego and I was like okay do I get on my knees now <laughs> my my friend said no get under the door facing yep yep duck and cover this is a great segue because how are you how do you achieve resilience well the first thing is knowledge mm -hmm. you learn and and I was really lucky Randy because uh I, I did it the lazy way I learned by example now, I know I look like I'm 19, but I'm actually much <laughs> older than that. I was born in the 60s. And way back then, if someone in their 40s had a child, everyone was completely freaked out. People just didn't do that. Well, my parents were both in their mid-40s when I was born. Wow. They, so they had lived through uh, the Depression as children. They lived through the Depression they lived through World War II. My dad was went to Okinawa and fought in World War II. They came back. My dad built a successful business, only to have that business uh, uh, undermined by a combination of, of a, a bad economic slump and a bad partner. Mm. Started completely over at 44, uh, sold everything they had, moved to a new place, started with nothing, and rebuilt uh, another successful business this time with no partner <laughs> and and uh and and live through all that and you would never know it they always had such a positive attitude their thing was thought life's going to throw things at you you know mm -hmm. And you know, you know how you know how pe people my mom was one of these you know sentimental people that had stuff all over a refrigerator right and she had this, this slogan that says, life breaks us all, but when we heal, we are stronger. I love that. Love that. That was, that was, that was their belief system. And so I was, you know, I was lucky. I didn't have to go and learn how to be personally resilient. What I had to learn was how that can translate into to making communities and, and, and states and countries more resilient. And yep. I did have to learn that. And, and that's a good question I have for you is like, when you're working with the United Nations, that's a big time. That's as big as you can get on a global scale with resilience. When there's an event that happens, are they reaching out to you? Are you reaching out to them? And how do you as that coordination work to be on the same page to then go out to a Puerto Rico, to a Japan, to a Katrina and get the resilience and get the reconstruction back working? No, that's a that's a great question. And if anyone any of you guys have studied the UN or have uh, been a, maybe a part of some UN activity, and uh, by the way, Randy, they're doing a lot now in zero carbon and carbon reduction, and a lot of it's good. You know, people knock the UN; they say it's a big bureaucracy. Yeah, and it is, but they still get great things done. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're lucky because we're directly affiliated with one of the economic commissions uh, of the UN and this center, which is a global center. It just happens to be housed at, in Geneva at UNECE. Uh, they do a great job of keeping us informed. Uh, and the, the real way you learn is through interaction with other people that are doing great things. So there are eight of these specialist centers. I'm the only one that deals in resilience, but they all touch resilience. You yeah. know, if you're not building in resilience, you're not, you're not, you're wasting your time. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, uh, and this is again, something that, that the listeners, if they're interested, uh, I'm a part of an organization that supports the United Nations resilient, and they call it uh, uh, the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Unit. 
And uh, I'm part of a private sector support group because I'm a nonprofit, but I'm not, you know, I'm not public uh, called Arise. And I'm also a part of a group that deals with public private partnerships as, as, a, as a nonprofit. And it's called the World Association of Public Private Par uh, Partnership Units and Professionals. And that's how you learn this stuff. You go out and you interact. You can take courses. There are, I think, 99 universities in the, in the states that offer courses in resilience and hundreds of universities around the world. And that's a good thing, too. I've taken courses. I mean, I started in this when I was in my 40s, and I've taken courses several. And so, you know, gaining knowledge is the, is the first step. But if you gain knowledge and you don't do anything with it, is it you know, useful? And, yeah. And, right. So, from so do, do you guys have meetings on a weekly, monthly basis, or is it like a quarterly thing? You guys come together. So, how? What's the the infrastructure to make a resilient happen? That's or a when great, the event happens. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so, the UN uh, group meets formally twice a year, but informally we have discussions with two, three, or four of of of, of us that that run these centers you know, a couple of times uh, a month at least. And then the, the organization, the membership organization, WAP as we call it, you know, they meet every week. So yeah. we're exchanging information and, and, and you know, the, the group, the RISE group meets uh, at least once a month. But the real knowledge comes from the informal interaction, you know, reaching out, forming relationships and reaching out and, you know, when you do that, then you're not only absorbing information, you're also helping others by giving them your experiences and the yeah. things that you've been through. And so, you know, you, the knowledge comes and then from the knowledge, you develop a set of principles, you know, in, in, any, in any endeavor, whatever you, whatever you do, whatever your major was in college, you learn some things that, you know, you have to carry forward to get things done, right? Yep. Those are the principles. And then out of the principles come, okay, how does this actually happen in the real world? And you hear a lot about this mystique of, strate of strategy. Strategy is nothing more than how do I get this done? Exactly. That's exactly. And we talk about that on this podcast a lot in terms of networking in the business realm, and entrepreneurship, and how do you keep those people around you, you're talking the same concept in a different way, but how do I work with people around the world, different languages, cultures, to bring people back from the brink of nothing? So it's a really interesting for me to sit here and hopefully my audience as well is hearing it from a different light, the same concept, but in a much more different aspect. Yeah, and and developing nations are, are really the hardest uh, work. Mm -hmm. uh, but what makes it worthwhile is to see people that either had nothing to begin with and, and, and had that wiped away, you know, had very little, mm -hmm. or people that uh, had, had, had achieved something in developing nations. But the, the capacity, and that's a really important word, the capacity of those places to help their own people is limited. Mm -hmm. So the thing we start with is, okay, what do we need to do on the ground right now to try to, to help this immediate situation? Then how do we build the capacity? How do we, again, build that resilience? What do we need to do to help them gain the resources? Uh, and, and oftentimes, Randy, you know, the, the problem is that the resources are there but they don't know how to access it. They don't know how to get to them. Mm. You know, there are, there are, you know, dozens of international aid organizations. There are non-governmental financial institutions like the World Bank. Uh, but how do they access those? And then how do they have a strategy? Do they know how to invest that resource mm. in a way that helps make the place that they're in more resilient. And again, this applies to countries, but it also applies to communities and individuals because it's the same, that the principles are the same, man, no matter what. 
So th does it take then if they don't understand how the user resources access them, feet on the ground, you all going out to these uh, third world countries, going out to these disaster places to then be more of the, say, project managers and saying, hey, this is what we need to do. We've done it here. Now we can do it for you guys here. Let's go ahead and set it up. And this is how you guys can help assist us. We're not, we're not project managers. We're teachers. 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 Sorry. Teach. Sorry. My apologies. No, no, no. Don't apologize. <laughs> because in the, we, we do manage, but in the process of that, we have to teach, mm -hmm. you know, it's the old Stephen Covey thing, you know, the, the guy that wrote the book years and years ago about uh, successful people. And he said, if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. This is how old it was. Sorry, sorry, uh, uh, women in the audience, but that's what he said. If you give a man a fish or a woman a fish, uh, they can eat for a day. If you teach them the fish, they can eat for a lifetime. Mm. So our job is to teach them the fish. Got it. So that next time, our job is to put ourselves out of business, that they don't need us anymore. That's the ultimate mm. goal. That now, would be amazing if you never had to do re recovery resilience again. That would be amazing. That well, you know, my wish is that that would be the case. Yeah. But the reality is, we had a record number. I, I wrote an article for Yahoo Finance. They asked me to write an article about COVID and the recovery, and I said uh, the the title of the article was "Disasters Don't Care About COVID nineteen. Mm. They care less." We had a record number of natural disasters last year. And for you all uh, on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, go to the bio, click the link. I'll make sure I get that link to article in here so you guys can read it because I'm sure it's really interesting. And, and what it says is absolutely COVID-19 is the worst disaster this planet's faced in 100 years, if ever. But it didn't mean that the other, that, that natural disasters just stopped. Yeah. They kept occurring. The most powerful, you know, we call them tornadoes. They call them typhoons in other parts of the world. The, the, the most, uh, the strongest typhoon to ever make landfall in recorded history hit the Philippines in November, November. Of 2020. Of so 2020. very, very recent. Very recent and very late. And so the, the National Hurricane Center who in, here in the U.S. that tracks the Atlantic hurricanes, the season used to be from June to November, to the 1st of November. Now they're thinking about making it from May, uh, May uh, 1st instead of June 1st to December 1st instead of November 1st. Mm, that's terrible. That's absolutely on the, so many different levels, economic, environmental, governmental. It's terrible. And it's all because well, I would like to think a lot of it's human man made and what we're doing to the world. Well, and, and I say I have my own opinions about <laughs> about climate change. But what I say is. You can you can debate all day long, whether it's man made or, or something else. The climate is changing. Yeah. I mean, you can't ignore the facts. The climate is changing. And what do we have to do? We have to adapt to that. We mm -hmm. have to. And, you know, it's like my own personal story. You mentioned, you know, the, the car crash that happened uh, way back in 1994. I was four years old, by the way, when that happened. I was just <laughs> driving without a license. That's a joke. A bad one. But uh, I had 16 broken bones. I had an adverse reaction to medication. I passed out the wheel and went through an intersection going what they estimate to be 85 miles an hour. Holy smokes. Thankfully, no one else was seriously injured. There was a man that had a pretty bad concussion uh, uh, and a broken arm, uh, but he recovered. Uh, and uh, uh, thank, thank goodness, nothing, no one else was, was injured, but several cars were destroyed. And my car was completely destroyed. And it's I unbelievable you survived. I, I, I had 16 broken bones. I flatlined in the ambulance. I lost uh, six pints of blood. Uh, they called the family in the night of the accident and said, hey, you know, you need to call, you know, everyone together because he's not going to make it. And I made it. And then I came out of a coma. I was in a coma for three days and they said, okay, uh, he's made it, but he's never going to walk again. So you need to prepare for that. 
Three months later, I walked out of the hospital using a walker, of course, uh, uh, because my my uh, I, I just refused. I refused to give up. And part of resilience is is will having the will. Mm -hmm. And for personal resilience is having the will to say no for community. Resi uh, this isn't I'm not going to accept this. For community resilience is having the will to do things and invest resources where they don't have an immediate return and where the return is, when I'm talking about return, I mean the financial return, the human return, there's, you know, that's priceless, right? Yeah. But still people are going to object and say, why do we need to do all this? Well, you need to do all this because number one, it could save lives. And number two, you know, Mr. Uh, you know, and I'm a free enterprise person. I don't say that, but you know, Mr. All you care about is money. It's going to cost you money and a lot of money, either yep. directly through damages to your own business or whatever you do or your employer or, and indirectly through tax dollars. So even if you don't care, you need to care because it's going to hit you and it's going to cost you. So when, when that, when that happened to me, you know, it really focused me and I said, okay, I, I'm really not supposed to be here and I'm here anyway. I got to do something. Yep. Well, it was an economic development for, that was the first part of my career. And so I took economic development uh, education in, into Mexico and I thought, well, this is great, but there was always something gnawing at me. And then I got into, through Katrina, I got into resilience and I, I knew then I'd found what I was supposed to be doing because it's, it's just the most gratifying thing you can ever do. So as you said, I'm in Puerto Rico and this tiny microscopic monster called flesh eating bacteria got in my bloodstream. And next thing I know, I'm having my left leg amputated. But you know, this is a, this, if you'll allow me, Randy, I know I'm going on and on, but no, this please, is a, this, this is really in captivating co content so please continue i'm really into it i know the audience is so so i i i had this amputation they fit me with a prosthetic and i start going to therapy and so i'm making progress in therapy but you know they, they the insurance company says okay get him to where he's independent he can do what he needs to do uh and then you're gonna have to release him so I, I reached that point where I could stand, I could walk with either crutches or a walker. Uh, and they said, okay, you're, you're independent. Well, so that's the knowledge is that I knew, I learned how to do that. I learned how to walk. I learned how to mm -hmm. step that leg, all of that. Right. And they would put me in parallel bars and let me walk independently for short length. So that's the knowledge. I had the knowledge. And then, you know, I developed a set of principles uh, and, and really this is more like goals, right? I want to be able to walk with nothing more than a cane. That's what I want to be able to do. And the principle behind that is I know I can do it because I did it in those parallel bars. Yep. So I had the knowledge then I developed the principles. And then one day I was talking to my, I have this very special friend I was talking, who inspires me and I was talking to her and I said, it just came into my mind. I said, what if I bought a set of parallel bars and put them in my house? Hmm. And she said, wow. And I said, yeah. So, you know, this is medical equipment. So I went on Amazon and ordered <laughs> the parallel bars, had them delivered and put them up in my, in my bedroom. So now I have a seven foot long set of parallel bars so you see how this is progressing? That's yeah. that's the action. And the result is I'm now walking, you know, about, about 200, 250 feet without touching those parallel bars. And I have no doubt that, that you know, by, by the time, hopefully, the economy is going to open up this summer, late summer, I'll be able to walk with maybe a cane. Uh, but that's that's the result. That's the outcome. So you can apply that to anything. Yeah. You can apply that to anything. Mine never matter. Mine never matter. And, and, you know, just following those simple steps. And that's how we create 
you know, resilience is through learning about how to be more resilient, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be, you know, Professor Dodd here and everyone, <laughs> are you ready? Do you have, you know, an emergency stash of water and canned food? Do you have backup power? Um, and, you know, people, people say, well, you know, people used to say, Randy, all the tornadoes happen in the Midwest. Well, guess what? They moved east. Atlanta got hit really hard like two days ago on a Monday. Yes. Yes. And the center of tornadic activity in the United States is now in what used to be the Deep South or still is the Deep South, now in the Deep South. So, you know, things can happen. They had an earthquake in Washington several years ago, Washington, D.C., not Washington State. (laughs) Which is unheard of. No place is immune from this. Not anymore. So we have to learn. We have to learn how to adapt to this climate that is going to continue to change. Mm-hmm. And and that's the message. And the message is you can do that at the national level, at the state level, or, or provincial if you're somewhere else outside the United States. You can do that at the community level. You can do that at the neighborhood level and you can do that at the personal level. And I think that's really key as we get through the pandemic and we start to open up more and more is resilient. We've had all a rough 12, 18 months and now we come back into it. Are we going to fall back into our old practices? People have talked about wanting to be more in touch with life, with nature, with each other. Are we going to do that or are we going to go fall back and we're going to let the pandemic happen again? Or in the terms of a macro level, are we going to prepare ourselves as a national government, as an international world, to make sure that doesn't happen again? Or 100 years from now, 50 years from here, from now, excuse me, are we going to be back in the same scenario? Right. And that's a really, really, uh, really great point, Randy, because, uh, you know, I, I see a, a blend of those two things. Mm-hmm. I see, you know, we're all dying to get back out and see our friends and family. So what do we do? We get a vaccine. You know, we get we get vaccinated as soon as possible. And now just about everyone that's over 18 can be can get a vaccination. Yep. And then we continue to follow some of these cautionary principles like social distancing. And, you know, if if everyone knows that everyone else has been fully vaccinated, then, you know, they've said it's okay. You can hang out together. You don't have to wear a mask. But if you're, you know, if you're out among people, you don't know whether those people are still, what, 50, 40 percent of the country hasn't even had one vaccine yet. Yeah. And we don't want to fall back. You know, look at what happened. to I have several friends in India and I'm oh, crying. So rough right now. It's so sad to see. But that was us like literally, what, five, six months ago, we were over 300,000 cases a day and we've done much better. India, I would say their infrastructure is probably not as resilient. There's like buzzword as ours is. So it's going to hit them that much harder, take that much longer. So can they build a sustainable, resilient thing once they're out of the the muck that they're in right now? Well, when this when this started, I I said, okay, I I really I literally had an epiphany because remember, I'm an economic development guy. Uh, But believe me, I'm very well aware of the personal toll that is taken in crises like this. But I had a, I, I woke up literally in a cold sweat, Randy, and this thing popped into my head and I wrote a LinkedIn post on it. And I said, we, we don't act now. We could see the mass extinction of small businesses around the world. Hmm. Around the, and in developing nations, small businesses are everything. Yep. They're, 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 you know, most of the economy here, most all the new jobs that are created are created by small businesses. So what are we going to do? So I put this, you know, this big research paper together and I looked at what it was, what's it going to take to adapt, to adapt, not the economic damage that's governments are doing that. What's it going to take to adapt the built environment? You know, everything from schools to hospitals to this new reality and looking at nine different sectors, you know, everything from 
services to manufacturing to all of these things. What's it going to take to adapt? And the, the price tag was seven trillion dollars around. Holy the world. smokes! Holy smokes! And and so, you know, we developed the mechanism to try to to address that. Uh, and again, focusing on countries that don't have the resources themselves. And that was adopted, that was accepted uh, by the, uh, the International Center of Excellence that I'm affiliated with. And so we're working on projects along that line now. What, what's one of the most, here, here's something that, that I, I think probably everyone is aware of. Uh, one of the most important things right now is universal broadband access, yeah. not just for communication, but for delivery of essential services, which, you know, may not be able to be delivered physically, but could be delivered o over broadband with, you know, with the component of, of, of delivery to homes and businesses. I mean, these are things that we're going to have to look at. Uh, uh, and we in, take in, for granted in America, but third world countries, disasters just hit. How do you communicate? How do you get stuff, vital stuff to people who need it? Exactly. Let, let me give you a startling, a startling statistic. In rural America, broadband access is less than 40%. Mm. Which is less than 40% in rural America. And, uh, you know, those of us that live in cities, we take it for granted. Of course it's yep. here. 5G. Like, why am I getting, what are you talking about? Rural America. No, but like, you never would think about that. I just said third world countries and you wound up and you said, no, it's actually happening here in your nation. You're not even thinking about it. It's fascinating. Yeah. Both my daughters are teachers and uh, they both. I'm not surprised. Not surprised. <laughs> they both, they both teach in, in rural uh, school districts. And so when they went to virtual classroom, virtual learning through broadband, uh, one daughter, uh, less than 30% of her students had broadband access. The other one, less than 15%. Hmm. This is this is rural America. And so we've, we've got to step up the game here. And that is, well, what does broadband have to do with resilience? You just described it. Yeah. How, are those kids, what are they going to do this whole past year? Do they just have to repeat whatever grade they're in? Do they just skip and not know that? It's really interesting. We've talked about the pandemic, us getting back, family, friends, but like, what's it done to our children and the generation of education? How's that going to affect them moving forward, moving into their further schooling, adult life, and the how's it going to affect our economy 10, 20 years down the line? Well, see, and, and, and what's interesting is that there are a lot of, a lot of uh, organizations now that are looking at this and saying, okay, this is, this is a terrible human cost. That's, that's number one. But it's also a terrible economic cost. Yes. There have been estimates in the billion, billions, tens of billions of dollars that, that the, the loss of this year for these kids and college students, I'm sure some of your listeners are still in college, the loss of learning this in, in this pandemic is going to cost billions and billions of, of dollars in, in lost productivity because kids are going to have, you know, their scores are going to go down. They're going to have to go to extra school, all of those things. Yep. And it all, it all fits together. Yeah. And you know, that, that same thing can be applied to a natural disaster that knocks out a community. And while that community is being rebuilt, what do the kids do? What do people do that had jobs that are wiped out? Um, and, and, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, one of the <clears throat> great stories in disaster uh, uh, recovery is a, a, a town in Kansas uh, that was wiped off the face of the earth, about 850 people, small town. And they rebuilt the town and they rebuilt it as a green uh, city, mm. a green community. Love that. And it's, it's very close to carbon, uh, uh, zero carbon. And uh, it's really a, a neat story of perseverance and saying, okay, this happened to us. Let's take this opportunity to do something better. And I think that's what we're, uh, you know, my hope is that's what we see across the world is that 
not only do we recover and rebuild, but we rebuild better. We rebuild more resilient. Uh, and we rebuild in, in ways that are more sustainable. Um, you know, that's, that's what I hope for. That's what I, you know, I think I was left here twice, not once, but twice on this planet. I shouldn't be here, Randy. Yeah. And I think I'm here for one reason, and that's to talk about this. And you say it with such a bright smile. And I think that's a great way for us to wrap up the podcast and bring it down third base is ending on the positive note of talking about resilient, the city and Kansas and the world coming back together with everything that we've just talked about. If there was just a quick high level, 30 second, one minute, this is the key takeaway for your audience. What would you say that is, David? Yeah, it all boils, you know, it all boils down to, you know, your, your, your own personal experience and your own personal life journey. And, you know, the things that, you know, those three things, uh, you know, gaining knowledge, you know, taking that knowledge and developing a set of principles, taking those principles and developing strategies to take action and taking actions it. And, you know, it, it reminds me when I was, I, I worked on a recovery project in, in Mexico, uh, in the, in the uh, Colorado River uh, Delta, not far from where you are in California. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a cab driver picked me up one night after I'd had dinner and he spoke perfect English. And uh, I said, he said, well, what are you doing here? I said, I'm uh, conducting a, a, a recovery for the uh, Colorado River uh, Basin. And um, we're trying to make it more stronger and more with, able to withstand earthquakes. And he got very emotional and he said, well, my son was uh, in the village that was, there was an entire village of 830 people that was killed by the earthquake. My son was in that village and, and he, uh, he perished. Mm. And he, he stopped at a stoplight and he turned around and looked at me with big tears coming down his eyes. And he said, I hope you are successful, Mr. Dodd. I hope you are successful. It's, a, it's so about, touching. It's it's about it's about that. It's about helping people. And if we all take that attitude in our lives and our work, uh, then the world's going to be a better place automatically. I agree, and that's what we are trying to do here at Leap of Fate with everybody who comes on. Inspire you to make changes in your life inspire you to help other people, inspire the world to become a better place. I think you've done an unbelievable job sharing that, David. I can tell we're both getting a little emotional right now thinking about it, is just how we can try to be sustainable, how we can be resilient, and how we can help make change in the world. And you do that daily in your personal life and your work, what you've overcome in your personal life and what you've done around the world and helping people bounce back from absolute tragedy to try to build a life back together. So thank you so much for coming on, David. You have been unbelievable. People want to reach out to you or find you. How can they do that? Very, very easy. Uh, you can go to, to my organization's website. And it's real simple. www.isrc, the abbreviation for my center, dash PPP, public private partnerships, dot org. Because we're a nonprofit. So wwwisrc ppporg Go to the website. You can contact us through the website. Contact me directly. I'd, I'd love that. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. And again, we will go ahead and post his links as well. LinkedIn, that link he just talked about inside the bio of have you're listening, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube. Have you're listening. Please do rate. Please do subscribe. It really means a lot to us. If you really like this message and what David talked about, please leave a review for us. Please go to YouTube. Watch this video with all the different stuff we talked about that will be running through it. David, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like I became a better person today. I know that my audience did. So now I'd like to do the sign outs with you. So please repeat after me. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay wealthy. Stay wealthy. And have a good week, fans. And have a good week, fans. Deuces. <laughs> Deuces. Thank you. And it's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Bye.